best represents the interests of people in trouble. In lieu of government, we've gotten used to nonprofit organizations coming up with projects, raising funds, and doing their best to help. There are some problems with that system, as we'll see today, but what are the alternatives? If government officials are intimidated by big donors and developers, and nonprofits typically go to those same big donors for gifts, Who's left to turn to? Today's guests, a writer and an activist, agree that people in trouble are best left to do it for themselves. In fact, they're excited that tenant-based neighborhood groups seem to be on the rise in response to pressure from developers, police, and what they call the do-good nonprofit complex. Doing it for ourselves, today on The Laura Flanders Show, and later an exclusive report on an upstate New York farm that's feeding people not the school-to-prison pipeline. All that and a few words for me on picturing austerity and the great national sick-out. Stay tuned. Craig Wilsey is a professor at George Mason University, an author who's also worked in social service. His new book is The Value of Homelessness, Managing Surplus Life in the United States. Imani Henry is the founder of Equality for Flatbush, a community-based organization in New York. As well as being a writer and performer, his works appeared in several books, including the Lambda Award-winning Does Your Mama Know and Marxism, Reparations, and the Black Freedom Struggle. Welcome to the program, both of you. Thank you. What are the challenges, as you see it, Imani, that, that people are facing uh, where you live in Flatbush, which may not be familiar to a lot of our viewers? Well, Flatbush is a, um, a, a, a very diverse uh, community that has mostly migrant folks. Folks are coming from, it's one of the largest enclaves of Caribbean, English-speaking Caribbean, uh, uh, Creole, Haitian, French-speaking Caribbean, African immigrants, but also uh, Central American and um, particularly Mexican immigrants at this point and South Asian immigrants, as well as a long history of Jewish um, and Irish and Italian um, families that have lived there. The big issue that it's always been a working to middle class community. Mm. And at this point, we're really seeing luxury developments popping up all over the place. Uh, studio apartments now going for almost $2,000 yeah. for a studio apartment, um, a two bedroom for $4,000, and people that are used to paying um, affordable rents, particularly um, in 2014, we had about 33,000 units of rent-stabilized apartments in Flatbush, and we're seeing such a decrease mm. in that. You talk about homelessness being very different in the 1930s sure. um, than it is today. Sure. Um, uh, in the 1930s, uh, people living without shelter, uh, for the most part, were uh, they were experiencing life without shelter because of joblessness mm -hmm. or low unemployment or, you know, exceedingly low wages. Were they called um, the homeless in those days? Uh, so that time was, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes in some contexts, but, you know, they often were, uh, again, seen more in terms of labor, right? So they were seen as unemployed. Um, and, uh, and of course, the, the conditions that people were living in were common conditions for uh, immigrant populations and for African Americans in the United States, but uh, when white male laborers faced that same crisis, the federal government responded because it understood it as a problem it needed to respond to. Mm -hmm. But the fix was largely a fix around labor. It was about finding ways to put people to work and some forms of housing uh, that were, you know, a kind of work camp, basically. Steinbeck stories, finding somewhere. Exactly. You, yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, but by the 1970s, uh, what I what I suggest in the book is that homelessness in a lot of ways becomes divorced from employment and from labor. It becomes kind of an independent part of the population in the United States. And what I mean by that is that people who are experiencing homelessness in the United States, uh, those experiences don't vary so much based on something like uh, rising unemployment or labor cycles or even necessarily their own experiences of employment. Um, it's become kind of a permanent feature mm. right. that's independent. Does this right. all make the Absolutely. sound right to you? Well, I think that one of the things that's very true at this point in time, and particularly in a city like New York, where we now have um, at upwards of 60,000 people in the, the shelter system a night, um, and there's been so much written about the fact that, you know, with gent the rise of gentrification, how we're dealing with lots of folks with jobs, um, families that have been long-term um, in New York City that are um, basically the working poor and have, because of, been, of displacement, yeah. are now in the shelter system. And yet in the same period, we've seen a massive explosion of nonprofits um, dealing, as it were, w with homelessness, trying, trying to address the problems, um, trying to find people, help uh, the mayor of New York, 
Bill de Blasio came in with a commitment to, to take action and help provide better services. You've worked in social service. What's your beef with all that? I mean, the problem with, with those services and with that approach is that they're, they're dealing with the effects of all of these systems. So they're dealing with the effects of um, our labor market, of our wage system, of, of our unaffordable housing system, uh, which produces people who are living really vulnerably. Um, but and and at their best, social services provide you know immediate shelter and other services for people, and and those services are really important. They save people's lives. Uh, living on the street, you know, mm -hmm. it literally shortens your lifespan. Um, but none of those services do anything to actually interrupt or challenge the structural forces that are producing homelessness in the first place. And so you, we've ha we've had a massive growth of a nonprofit system around homeless services, but the, you know at the very best, it's a band aid for the people who are who are served by that. But you know, but often those services also are working in concert with the same forces that are producing displacement. Well, explain in the first how, because I mean, the image that we have is people trying to help and caring a lot, and we see movies of people really caring. And yes. Well, I think about so organizations I've worked for. I'm also a social worker and worked for organizations like Housing Works, for mm -hmm. instance, that started off as um, the housing working group of a group like ACT UP. The and AIDS coalition. the AIDS coalition, and really looking at the fact that exactly that 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 people that are living on the street and are HIV positive that that it's actually more dangerous and more hazardous, and really that housing is right, housing works, and the understanding that we had to do direct action, mm -hmm. that we had to organize. We being not people working for nonprofits. Well, well, actually, that the whole concept of the understanding that as, when I was a worker there, that we had three direct action days. The concept that we had to actually mobilize, that there was a movement that we're a part of. And I think that's the difference between a nonprofit, that, an agency that's just providing services and not involved in political mm. organizing in our community, that it can't just be one or the other. I remember when I worked on the board for the, a group called New York Women Against Rape, and one of the big pauses, moments where we kind of paused to wonder what was happening was when, if I remember correctly, this was the early 80s, the group got its first contract with the city. Mm to work actually in shelters, I think it was. And people said, whoa, what, how will that affect our relationships to activism and to change? Right. Um, is that why you left social service? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe there's a longer story reasons. there. Um, uh, I mean, my own experience working, I first uh, got involved in, in housing work, working at a shelter run by um, an organization that provides services for uh, gay and lesbian trans populations in Los Angeles. So I worked at like a youth ho housing program there. Um, and again, the program provided really essential services for people who mostly had lived in the foster care system. And then at 18, they aged out of foster care, had nowhere you know, to go. Um, and that agency really saw its mission as serving queer and trans homeless youth. Mm -hmm. and, um, and while, of course, Gender identity and sexual identity affect people's uh, ability to access housing. That's not the whole story. Mm -hmm. And so what I saw there was that the agency had defined homelessness in this really narrow way. Mm -hmm. They were doing gay homelessness. Um, but the youth living in that program, uh, the youth living in that program weren't just gay or trans. Most of them were of color. Many were first or second generation immigrants. Most of them had family members caught up in the prison system. Many of them had also been caught up in that system. So they had a whole complex set of factors that were producing their homelessness. You're both saying there's a value to looking at the specificity, but if it's the wrong specificity, we won't have the breadth of the coalition that we need to make change. But I don't want to lose in all of this your fundamental point in the book and, both, and your work, which is a solution hmm. needs to be found. Yeah. Yeah. So pick up on any of that. Sure. So uh, to go back to Amani's point earlier about um, the ways that social services have become divorced from social movements, I think this is really key, so that we have had kind of like a depoliticization of something like homelessness. So it's seen as like a personal problem that's solved through intervention at, at personal levels. Um, and that obscures all these systems that we're, we're asking people to draw attention to. For me, the work that I'm most excited about right now is work that's making exactly the links Amani mm. was talking about. Uh, I don't think we can, we can't effectively challenge homelessness if we're not challenging gentrification and we're not challenging uh, policing and incarceration. Those things are very linked. Um, uh, social services, in some ways, do the soft work that our police and prison systems are doing, mm -hmm. a more violent version of, which is cleaning up streets and getting people out of the way of the expansion of tourist and consumer economies in cities. So, uh, so there's work going on, of course, here in Brooklyn, um, 
There's a group in Los Angeles, Youth Justice Coalition, which has been doing amazing work for a long mm -hmm. time, fighting criminalization of youth in LA, and recently has been taking on gang injunctions, which are a tool that broadly criminalize youth in neighborhoods that are undergoing gentrification. Mm -hmm. And so they're recognizing that it's a tool for displacing people. It's not just to get people into prison, but it's also to get people out of neighborhoods. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. we, we, here in New York, picture the homeless um, is an amazing organization that one um, is leading the way. This is f currently homeless and formerly homeless people who have organized around one, they're the leaders around the community land trust movement in New, in New York, but also nationally. Um, and really looking at, um, they themselves have been able to secure um, a piece of property that they want to fight the city and say, this should be for affordable housing. What difference would a land trust make with that? Well, community land trust, people? the whole piece of the understanding um, is a, about it being collectively owned by a community and that then they setting, they become, quote unquote, the landlord of this piece of property and being able to set into motion what, um, what the rent is. And so for instance, we have, um, uh, Cooper Square, which is like a long-standing land trust for people that's been affordable for oh, decades yeah, that people can live years, in. Picture the Homeless also did a survey of the entire, of all the vacant, of, um, abandoned, boarded up housing and in 2012 did a whole report and said that there was over 5,000 pieces of land um, between the five boroughs of New York that could be used for affordable housing. They were able to say, if you were able to release these, to the, to the public, to stop hoarding them, stop letting developers have them, we could make sure that everyone could have affordable homes because, and that would be a permanent solution. Mm. So not the church, not the state, as they used to say, <laughs> not the nonprofit complex will do this work. How will it be done and how will it be funded? What, what do you see that's out there that, that you think provides a model if you want to do it differently? <laughs> I, I really think it's important that we also uh, see ourselves as being collectively a part of the solution. That one, that we're, if we can't give money, then we give our time and our effort and we volunteer. Um, that we really know, and we, we talk about it all the time, we, we work with new residents and long-term residents. We actually don't use the word gentrifier. We use it as the folks that don't come to our meetings, they don't take our flyers, they don't show up to our marches. Those are the folks that are, they think they're doing well that's fine. Well, we say that we're all in this together. And we try to pull and mobilize people to say, we're fighting for our lives to stay in the city, and how can we be a part of that? And that also means giving our of a money, mm -hmm. um, that we can't just rely on funders, that we have to do it ourselves. So we do a lot of fundraising through our community. So self-sustaining yeah. organizations. I also want to say, you know, I think um, we can't throw nonprofits out the window overnight, and I'm not sure that we necessarily want to. No, well, um, obviously it's a mixed bag. But, right. yeah. And so, but, so thinking about, like, uh, I think there are good models also of, of nonprofit organizations that have ties to social movements, that have ties to right. grassroots work, and that see their mission, the nonprofits see their mission as supporting that work. Mm. So there's an organization in Washington, D.C. called the Coalition for Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development. They've been working on a really interesting affordable housing campaign called Housing for All. One of the things I really like about it is that they're working across all these different levels of housing. So from shelters, mm -hmm. right, through rental programs, through public uh, housing programs, through uh, home ownership mm. uh, and programs that allow tenants to buy their buildings. And so kind of defying all the divisions right. that the social service models put in place and said, homeless people are a special case, people in public housing are a special case. But it's actually looking at housing needs across all these different levels. And, and that's, again, an organization that sees its work as mm. supporting right. you know, tenant-powered work. Craig's book is The Value of Homelessness, Managing Surplus Life in the United States. I really recommend you checking it out. And Imani Henry, we'll put more information about your group at our website. Thank you both for coming Thank in. Thank you so much. No, he's no, he's, no, he's, no, he's no. <laughs> We started out as a family farm. We knew that we wanted to grow food for our neighbors. We're living in the south end of Albany, which is, the USDA terms it a food desert neighborhood. Uh, we prefer to talk about food apartheid because deserts are natural phenomenon and, you know, racism in the food system is very unnatural. We're talking to our neighbors about it. We got a lot of encouragement to start a farm and then to do doorstep delivery in that neighborhood. So that's how it started.
there was demand for training programs that were culturally sensitive for black and Latino folks, so we kind of developed that. So I feel like we're very much in conversation with the movement and in conversation with our community. The movement for black lives is very much about ending police sanctioned violence against our people, against black and brown people. So we know about police brutality and murder and we know about mass incarceration. That's all over the news and it should be. It's really important. But a lot of times what falls away from the conversation is that you know, the top five killers for black and Latino people in the United States are diet related illness. And that's not accidental. There's all these policies in place that are state created that cause this disconnect between black folks and good food. And similarly, over our history, our access to land has very much been influenced by U.S. policy, USDA discrimination, by violence from the Ku Klux Klan that targeted black landowners. In the early 1900s was the peak of black land ownership. In the 1910 census, um, black folks owned and operated about 14% of U.S. farms. And that was, you know, at a higher percentage than we made up in the population. And so there was a long time throughout history when the most likely occupation you'd find an African-American person would be farming, and now that's the least likely. Many of our people have confused the oppression that took place on land with the land itself. And so there's a lot of ancestral, almost cellular trauma that's associated with wild spaces and with land. The truth is that we do all belong to land and we have a right you know, to belong to land and reclaim agency in the food system, but there's a healing process that needs to happen. And part of that is knowing our history. It's not so much that we are like stepping into this white good food movement, that this has always been our movement and that history has done its best job to alienate us from land and to tell us that we don't belong and it's not our story, but it's always been our story. And so it's been important for us to, you know, find those anecdotes and evidence of the strength of our people related to land and uplift them. You know, Fannie Lou Hamer's cooperative movement is, you know, now everyone's talking about cooperatives, but that's not new. You know, she was figuring out how to pool money to get kids into college and to buy a new tractor and to pay per people's burial expenses and share land and share barns, you know, a long time ago. And, and maintain the plants too as exactly. you're going. Clear the okay. whole, all the lower leaves. Well, something's getting into here and eating this stuff. So our programming has grown a lot faster than our capacity to manage it. So when we have uh, apprentices here or when we have training groups here, they literally sleep on the floor of our house or camp out and then when it rains the camp out people come and sleep more on the floor of our house so we are trying to expand our infrastructure so that we don't have to turn anyone away who wants to learn how to farm and and you know work for food justice so this is our latest project we did a crowdfunding campaign we're two-thirds of the way there our new apprentices will be moving in in april and that's pretty much when the programming season starts so we have a few months to to make it happen you know, it's a program space and a sleeping space for folks who come for Black and Latino Farmers Immersion. For our, uh, we have a program next year for white folks who are interested in undoing racism in the food system. So we have a lot of programs, and there's you know a need for comfortable, warm, you know, dry space. And so that's what this area is going to serve. We want to be not just environmentally sustainable, but really a model of financial solvency and sustainability and justice as well. So we only do direct marketing to families. We do a farm share program where a family joins. They call it Netflix for vegetables, right? So a family joins at the beginning of the season. They make a commitment to us that they're going to participate for the you know, entire 22 weeks. We make a com commitment to them to give a fair share of like beautiful, healthy vegetables delivered to their doorstep. We've sort of bound ourselves together in this way that um, isn't as casual as the capitalist market would have you define economic relationships where it's like, do I want this or do I return it and let me go to the next store and shop around. It's really making this commitment to one another as human beings and also to this local economy. And so I think there's a lot that's right in that and we just have to figure out how to scale it up to first our institution, right, and then also to you know society as a whole. So 
So this is the east field because it's east <laughs> of the rest of the property. And we are planting cover crops in a half acre in this field this coming year to prepare it for vegetable production in 2017. So we just plant like buckwheat and clover and all of these plants that are alchemists that are able to take air and turn it into soil. They can take you know, nitrogen from the air and carbon from the air and turn it into organic matter. And that feeds and builds up the soil so that you know, the following year it will be ready to plant. So Wendell Berry has this amazing quote. Uh, when people ask you what you grow, tell them your main crop is the forest, which you will never harvest. You know, I think it's really important that we see reflections of ourselves in the movements that we're part of. And so I remember in my earlier days of deciding to start a farm, and there wasn't a lot of publicity for the farm. Maybe there was one article that someone had written, you know, today's black farmer doesn't look like what you think. You know, this young woman of color, not this older, weathered, you know, southern black man. And I got this call from a woman in Boston who I didn't know, just a cold call. And she said she just wanted to hear my voice to know that it was possible because she's a black woman who had encountered a lot of discrimination and obstacles in trying to become a farmer, not just from the white world, but from her own family. Like, how could you do this? Go backwards, essentially, is how it was seen. And she was completely in tears because she just needed to know it was possible. You know, I'm really influenced by my ancestors, including my adopted Hebrew ancestors. So the Talmud teaches us that, um, you know, not to be overwhelmed by the grief and despair of the world, that we're not obligated to finish the work, right? But we are obligated to always take a step in the direction of completing the work. That was our exclusive report on Soul Fire Farm from our producer, Anna Barsan. You can get more information at lauraflanders.com. A picture is worth a thousand words, they say, and that was certainly the case earlier this year when public school teachers in Detroit started tweeting out and posting online pictures of the crumbling schools in which they work. After months of attempting to grab legislators' attention to a crisis, the teachers called in sick en masse earlier this year, causing almost all city schools in Detroit to close. And while they withdrew their labor, they flooded the social media with images of just what they were so sick of. Broken toilet seats in the students' bathrooms, mushrooms on their classroom walls, leaking ceilings, moldy food. The teachers sent out pictures of something that's had a hard time getting seen, the social cost of austerity programs. The teachers secured attention from at least one national candidate, Hillary Clinton, who pointed out that such conditions wouldn't be tolerated in more affluent places. Mm -hmm. Majority Republicans in Michigan's legislature threatened new laws to make it easier to crack down on protesting workers. We'll see which way the wind blows. Meanwhile, it is worth reviewing how the Detroit schools got into such a fix. According to the protesters, the system wasn't always broke. An analysis by the Citizens Research Council, a Michigan-based policy group, confirms that the schools were enjoying a surplus in the 90s. Today, 41 cents of every dollar appropriated for schools is being spent on servicing city debt. Detroit is very far from the only city in the USA that's mortgaged its public assets to pay off private lenders. What's the cost? Well, it's not entirely clear, and we're not getting the picture in the media. We tend to privatize our problems. What the teachers did was broadcast theirs and their students to the world. Perhaps it's time for others to snap pictures of their public institutions, their libraries, their schools, their public colleges, their court buildings. What's austerity look like where you live? We are way past due for a great national sick out. To tell me what you think or send me those pictures, write to laura at lauraflanders.com.
thepodcastnetwork.com. And thanks. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. If you're buried in bad news and put off by partisan puff, you have come to the right place. For smarts, not sound bites, in depth conversations with forward thinking people, subscribe right now to The Laura Flanders Show, where all the people who say it can't be done take a backseat to the people who are doing it. Also available as a podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever you get your podcasts. Join us. Is gentrification inevitable? There are models of development that don't displace the vulnerable. I talk with an organization that is fighting back against blight and displacement. We really need to start working on taking this energy and moving it beyond just, you know, we don't want to be murdered by the police to we want to control the decision making on every level in our communities. And later in the program, a few words from me on the great corporate buy-up. Today on The Laura Flanders Show, Gwen Hallsmith talks about race, gender, and bias in banking. Could we ever be free of it? We can start to close the gap between the 1% and the rest of us. And later in the show... The areas where you're poor and the areas where there's majority, minority, those areas tend to have the greatest crisis waiting to explode. And a few words from me on dark money and shedding light. We can do it. Mm -hmm.